Hello, I'm Ming Qi, and I'm here with my teammates Luis, Martin, and Yonghe. In this video, we're going to talk about molybdenum disulfide in field effect transistors, focusing on defects in charge transport. We'll start with a brief introduction of MOS2, then we're going to zoom in to its charge transport models, the electron scattering and mobility issues, and we'll end with a discussion on the growth techniques. Molybdenum disulfide, or MOS2, is an inorganic compound that belongs to a famous group of 2D materials, the transition metal ditrocogenides. It has unique crystal and band structures, which make it an attractive material for the next generation semiconductor devices. The structures of MOS2 differ at different dimensions, and its characteristics and applications also change correspondingly. MOS2 exists in 2D as nanosheets and nanoribbons, and in 1D as nanowires and nanotubes. It also has a 0D structures like quantum dots and nanoplatelets, and it is a silvery black solid in its bulk form. Its bulk structure can be triagonal, hexagonal, or rhombohedral, and the three main structures of MOS2 are 1T, 2H, and 3R, where 1T is metallic and the other two are semiconducting. The most stable form of MOS2 is the 1H configuration, which is the sandwich structure formed by two hexagonal planes of sulfur and one hexagonal plane of molybdenum, as shown in the figure here. Each molybdenum atom in the intermediate plane is ionic covalent bonded to six sulfur atoms in the top and bottom planes. This ensures the stability of the MOS2 monolayer. The bulk crystal can be formed by stacking multiple MOS2 monolayers where the layers are attached to each other by weak van der Waals force. The interlayer distance is about 0.65 nanometers. Due to the weak forces between the sheets and the anisotropic character of MOS2, sharing can take place very easily, which makes MOS2 good for lubricant applications. The weak van der Waal interlayer bonding also allows the stacking of MOS2 layers in arbitrary crystallographic orientations without lattice matching. So heterostructure devices can be made uh, that can exhibit different properties from their parent materials. Also, the crystal structure of MOS2 gives it good mechanical properties. The implant stiffness of MOS2 monolayer is found to be around 180 newtons per meter which corresponds to an effective Young's modulus of 280 gigapascal. This is very high and is com comparable to the Young's modulus of steel. And similar to graphene, MOS2 has a strong implant and low out-of-plane bending rigidity, which allows it to be bent to high degrees without breaking. Studies have found that MOS2 can stand a tensile strain up to 11% without rupture. The breaking strength of MOS2 is higher compared with flexible plastics such as PI or PDMS. These good mechanical properties make MOS2 an attractive material for flexible electronic devices. Besides its layered structure, MOS2 has also attracted great interest due to its sizable band gap. In book form, the band gap of MOS2 is about 1.2 eV and is indirect. As the number of layers is being reduced, the band gap increases gradually and reaches about 1.9 eV in monolayer. And at this point, it also becomes a direct band gap. Here are two diagrams showing the energy bands of MOS2 in both bulk form and in monolayer. The dashed red line indicates the FATME level. The blue line represents the top of the valence band, and the green line highlights the bottom of the conduction band. We can see in the left diagram, 
the band gap transition at the gamma point is indirect for bulk materials, but it gradually shifts to be direct for the monolayer as shown in the right diagram. The direct exotonic transitions at the K point remain relatively unchanged with the layer number. Um, this change in the band structure with the layer number is due to quantum confinement and the, re the resulting change in hybridization between P orbitals on sulfur atoms and D orbitals on molybdenum atoms. For MOS2, the conduction band states at the K point are mainly due to localized D orbitals on the molybdenum atoms, which are located in the middle of the sandwiched layer. So as we bring the single layers close to each other to form the bulk structure, they are relatively unaffected by interlayer coupling. That's why the direct exotonic states near the K-point are relatively unchanged as we reduce the layer number. However, the states near the gamma point are due to combinations of the anti-bonding p-orbitals on the sulfur atoms and the d-orbitals on the molybdenum atoms, which have a strong interlayer coupling effect. Therefore, as the layer number gets smaller, the transition at the gamma point shifts significantly from an indirect one to a direct one, and the band gap also becomes larger. Um, another interesting point is that the band gap in monolayer MOS2 is about 1.9 eV, which falls in the visible range, and this makes MOS2 a good material for optoelectronics as well. So far, we have discussed the crystal and electronic band structures of MOS2. They give rise to interesting properties and make MOS2 suitable for many applications. Here are some of the sensing applications that MOS2 can be used for. For example, it can be used in gas sensors for, for the detection of nitrogen dioxide or ammonia. It can be used in refractive index sensing and due to its biocompatibility, MOS2 is also widely explored in biomedical applications, such as the detection of cancer cells and Alzheimer's disease. And these various sensors or applications are realized mainly through transistors. So now let's turn to how MOS2 can be implemented in field effect transistors. Desirable properties for transistors include high charge carrier mobilities, which allows for fast operation. The on and off ratio is the ratio of on state to off state conductance, and high on and off ratio is needed for effective switching. It is also aimed to achieve high conductivity and low off state conductance for low power consumption during operation. As we've mentioned earlier, compared with classical 3D electronic materials, the sub-nanometer thickness of MOS2, along with this tunable band gap in the 1 to 2 EV range, help to optimize these properties, and it can help to reduce short channel effects and power dissipation, which are the main limiting factors to transistor miniaturization today. In a basic uh, FET structure, a semiconducting channel region is connected to the source and drain electrodes and separated by a dielectric layer from a gate electrode. The current flowing between the source and drain is controlled by the gate electrode modulating the conductivity of the channel. Here shows the first implementation of a top-gated transistor based on monolayer MOS2. The MOS2 monolayer is used as the semiconducting channel on top of a degenerately doped silicon substrate covered with silicon dioxide. The source and drain electrodes are made of gold and HFO2 is used as a high K gate dielectric for the local top gate, which also boosts the mobility to realize the full potential of the single layer MOS2. And here on the right are the optical images of the MOS2 monolayer sitting on silicon dioxide, and also the fabricated device that consists of two field effect transistors connected in series. This device gives an excellent on and off ratio of about 10 to the 8. 
It also demonstrates n-type conduction and the room temperature mobility exists 200. It demonstrates the potential for using MOS2 layers to achieve better performance in field effect transistors. Now with some MOS2 basics in mind, we can dive deeper into the detailed mechanisms. And I'll hand it over now to Martin to talk about charge transport in MOS2 transistors. Hello, my name is Martin Gonzalez, and in this part of the presentation, I will be discussing charge transport models from molybdenum disulfide in field effect transistors. And specifically, I will be talking about how mobility and conductivity is modeled in this material for this application. So to start off, let's think about mobility. Mobility characterizes the drift velocity in response to an electric field for electrons in a given conductive media. The mobility itself is very closely related to the conductivity of the material. The mobility has various different contributions, including from impurities, from lattice, from phonons, and from defects. We can see on this chart on the right-hand side of the slide that 2D materials in general have very poor mobility in comparison to bulk semiconductors. So while 2D materials have great promise for electronic devices, we need to find a way to enhance their mobility through growth techniques and through defect engineering. Therefore, it is important that we understand how to model mobility in 2D semiconductors and especially in MOS2. In the bottom, we show a pictorial of the field effect transistor, which includes a thin film of MOS2 on a silicon dioxide substrate and with source and drain electrodes. Now, the way that mobility is measured in these devices is by taking IV characterization curves of the drain and source current and voltage in the linear regime where it is ohmic. We then take the, the, the slope of this line along with other physical parameters, including the capacitance, the length and width of the MOS2 device. And with that, we can measure the mobility of the system. Like we discussed in class a couple of weeks ago, we can identify some general trends in semiconductor mobility. In particular, at high temperatures, we see that mobility is limited by the presence of phonons as higher energy phonons are being activated. In the low temperature regime, we have charge impurity limited and other carrier mobility models that are limited by defects within the material itself. And we can start to see that based on some data that have been shown in recent literature, where we see that in the high temperature regime, we have a given Arrhenius relationship that shows phonon limited scattering. And in lower temperatures, we have other models that take over that take into account charge impurities, or other defects in the semiconductor that I will discuss in the next couple of slides. But before we get into these more complicated models of described 2B materials, I want to talk about the effects of defect states in the mid-gap first. So as we discussed in class before, conduction in semiconductors occur when electrons move through extended states in the conduction band. However, the presence of defects introduce states within the band gap. And sometimes electrons occupy these states and through thermal excitation can move on to the extended states. In the case where conduction is dominated by movement of electrons through extended states with brief occupation of electrons in localized states in the band gap, we have multiple trapping and release, which is expressed through Arrhenius relationship because it is a thermally activated process where electrons are excited near in the localized states near the band edge and into the extended states that is a conduction band. However, for the 2D material that we will discuss here, which is molybdenum disulfide, we have something called the variable range hopping model, which is fairly similar to tight binding model, where instead of having electrons moving freely through the conduction band, electrons are localized in states in real space 
and they basically hop in between these localized states in a probabilistic fashion, which is described in this equation in the bottom left. This is the general equation describing the probability of hopping in between different states. This can also be used to derive a mobility equation shown in the bottom left, where mu naught is a base mobility, T naught is a characteristic temperature which corresponds to a correlation energy, KT naught, and D, which is a dimensionality, where in molybdenum disulfide, D equals two. So we have this relationship right here, where the conductivity and mobility in turn can be described as a power law to the power of negative one third, or an exponential law, I mean, to the negative one third. Now, how does this variable range hopping model arise? One way is through sulfur, sulfur vacancy states, which are fairly common in molybdenum disulfide. And we can see this arise in both the dispersion relation in the left and the density states on the right, where we have the conduction band being dominated by delocalized molybdenum 40 states and a dispersionless mid-gap states from the sulfur vacancies, which are highly localized, which is given by the fact that these curves are very flat, meaning that it has a very high um, effective carrier mass. So these electrons are basically localized around these sulfur vacancies, as can be shown in the image in the bottom, where you have the red demonstrating accumulation of charge near the sulfur vacancy. And essentially, the variable range in Hoffman model takes form when you have lower, lower carrier concentrations, when the Fermi level lies along the sulfur vacancy states. And so you have the electrons being localized at these states. And so transport is modeled using the variable range hopping. However, at high carrier concentration, the Fermi level is located higher up near the conduction band. So transport is more band-like, which is similar to what we discussed in the multiple uh, catch and release. We can further see how charge accumulates near these localized states in the plot in the top left where the charge density spikes approximately between two and three angstrom from the sulfur vacancy. And we can use certain parameters including R, which is a hopping distance, and this Greek symbol chi, which represents the distance from the sulfur vacancy where we have an accumulation of charge density. And we can basically do an optimization of this probability to show an optimal hopping distance. And so we can figure out the distance and energy that it takes an electron when it jumps in between these sites in the variable range hopping model. And this is verified when we norm when we take a plot of normalized conductivity as a function of inverse temperature and see that in this regime for temperature, we have a t to negative one third power law which corresponds to the variable range hopping. This model also takes form when we look at other types of impurities, especially charge impurities on the substrate surface. In the top left-hand corner, we can see that the mobility has a linear relationship with respect to t to the negative one-third, showing that we do indeed have variable range hopping as a result from these defects. But how do we know the defects are a result of charge impurities in the substrate surface? Well, we can plot T naught, our characteristic temperature, as a function of the back gate voltage. And we see that regardless of the type of device made based on different growth parameters, but right here we have three layer, one layer, etc., they all follow more or less the same curve. And so they must all have a common defect source. And this defect source has been stipulated to be charge defects on the substrate surface. Now, how do we know that these are the defects we're looking at? Well, we can plot the conductivity as a function of the back gate voltage. And we know that if we see an N squared type relationship, it is a bare Coulomb impurity, which will correspond to substrate charge impurities. However, it has an N relationship if they're screened, which corresponds to more bulk type uh, defects, which can be screened by the material itself. And we see right here that we do have a delta V squared relationship. Therefore, we have bare Coulomb impurities that must come from the substrate surface. Finally, we can talk about the effect of the thickness of the MOS2 on mobility. 
the thickness itself can be characterized using AFM images, where we can see the different thicknesses from the topology taken by the AFM, or also through Raman, where we see shifts in the E2G and A1G curves as a function of the different layers we see in the MO2 surface. On the middle plots, we see that the mobility reaches a maximum somewhere in between 5 and 10 layers and drops off either way. Part of the reason behind this is that as the thickness increases, the effect of substrate charge impurities can be mitigated as a result of additional screening just in virtue of having more layers. However, if we add too many layers, we start to get series resistance, which basically decreases the mobility beyond that that we can see an improvement beyond five to 10 layers. Now we can use this knowledge in engineering field effect transistors through a metal to insulator transition. If we know the thickness of the sample, we can tune the temperature and the gate voltage to make the MOS2 insulating or metallic to our desire. In addition, we can also see that there is a shift in peak mobility temperature with thickness, which can be attributed to electron photon interactions. And the way we know that is because the mobility, which is modeled as photon limited, takes on this T to negative gamma power. And in theory, this gamma should be 1.69, but we see in this plot in the left-hand side that they extract an experimental gamma value somewhere between 0.5 and 0.7, meaning that there is a suppression of the electron photon interaction in thicker MOS2, which reduces the effect of these phonons in when taking into account mobility. And finally, on the right-hand side, we once again hammer home the effect that at high temperatures, we see that mobility is limited by phonons rather than in the lower temperature regime. Yeah, the lower temperature regime where we once again have variable range hopping for all the different layers. The parameter space for studying mobility in MOS2 is wide. And right here, we have identified some of them, including temperature dependence of mobility, the effects of carrier concentration, the thickness, substrate interface defects, charge defects, etc. So once we understand mobility, we need to understand how we can improve it by defect engineering or different growth processes. And these are topics that will be discussed in the future, or actually by my uh, fellow classmates in the next couple of slides. Um, hello. So following up on Martin's discussion on the charge transport model in MOS2, I'd like to discuss more in detail about the electron scattering mechanism and then the mobility in MOS2. In particular, I would like to describe um, discuss how the um, high-K dielectric substrate environment can affect the electron mobility in MOS2. Uh, so uh, a very thin semiconductor, like a 2D material like MOS2, uh, can be applied in electronic devices, such as the field effect transistor that ming -Chi earlier showed. And in this uh, device structure, you can see that the MOS2 is surrounded by the two high-K dielectrics, um, more specifically hafnium oxide and then the silicon oxide. Then the key question is, how does this uh, dielectric environment affect the electron mobility in MOS2? Uh, for, for this presentation, I'll be focusing on the two key uh, aspects of the scattering, number one, the scattering that comes from the ionized impurity, and then number two, the scattering that comes from uh, the electron and then the phonon scattering, specifically the remote optical phonon that exists in this dielectric substrate environment. And as you can see in the Matheson's rule, uh, the electron mobility can be um, thought as the sum of the different scattering sources, 
Um, so uh, in this uh, in this equation, we can see that there's a charge impurity plays a role, phonon also plays a role, and then also there's a um, uh, surface roughness. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I would like to focus on these two um, separate uh, factors in electromobility. So uh, how does the dielectric environment affect the Coulomb potential? So, uh, so we'll first discuss about the on-screen Coulomb potential. So again, like the when we think about the that's the effective screen potential, we need to consider the dielectric constant. But we will first look at how the on-screen Coulomb potential looks in this sandwich structure. So structure is as follows: in the middle, we have the MOS two, and then the the two uh, and then it's surrounded by uh, the dielectric material with this. Uh, with with the particular dielectric constant, uh, so when it's sandwiched by the um, the dielectric environment, we can think of the system as a infinite series of point image charges. So if we have a point uh, impurity charge here, then there will be infinite array of the image charges uh, at this specific uh, specific um, along this specific axis. Um, now, uh, what we need to consider is what's the magnitude of it. Um, from the detailed calculation, it shows that the magnitude is proportional to the charge times this gamma factor. And this gamma factor um, depends on the difference between the dielectric constant of the semiconductor, um, which is epsilon s, and then the um, dielectric constant of the surrounding material, which is epsilon e. Now, if we consider a case where the um, dielectric constant of the surrounding material is larger, then you can see that the gamma will become negative. So the sign of the uh, image charges will, uh, will alternate between the positive and negative because the gamma is being uh, powered by a vector of n. So if we look at this picture of where the epsilon of the um, surrounding matrix is larger, you can see that the, uh, the image charges cancel each other out. So the, the flux line uh, doesn't exist outside the semiconductor layer, which result in the spread of the electric, uh, electric flux line near the electron. However, when we consider the case where the surrounding material has a lower dielectric constant, then you will have the gamma factor as positive. So we will have the net image charges uh, along, uh, along this line, uh, along this plane. And we will have the electric flux lines bunching in near the electrons, hence creating a, a larger Coulomb potential. So this can be more intuitively seen by looking at this diagram. So again, if we go from the um, surrounding dielectric material, only one to the same as the OMS2, and then having a really large dielectric constant, you can see that the on-screen Coulomb potential becomes more confined and smaller near the impurity charge. So basically, in conclusion, uh, with the higher dielectric constant surroundings, the on-screen Coulomb potential will be very confined and then, uh, 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 yes, and then reduced in intensity. So, okay, so we consider the on-screen Coulomb potential coming from the sandwich structure. So now we need to think about what would happen to the, um, the effective dielectric constant of this overall system to eventually see what's the screened Coulomb potential. So uh, surprisingly, what we, uh, okay, so firstly, when we think about the electron screening in a solid, then we can invoke the Thomas Fermi screening, which is a large Q limit of the more generalized Lintard theory. So from this Thomas Fermi screening, we can see that the, um, the effective dielectric constant is equal to one plus uh, the Thomas Fermi wave vector over Q. So uh, as a figure of merit, we can think about uh, what's this Q uh, Thomas Fermi wave vector uh, compared to the wave vector when we do not have any surrounding dielectric. That is the Q uh, not uh, in this equation. So uh, this Q effective over Q naught uh, will tell us whether the dielectric constant of the overall system will increase or decrease. But uh, from the detailed calculation, it shows that as the environment dielectric constant increases, this uh, Q effective over Q naught actually decreases meaning that the overall dielectric constant of the system will decrease 
as a function of uh, the dielectric constant of the environment. So now this is quite opposite to our intuition from earlier picture where the Coulomb potential uh, becomes more confined uh, in large parts uh, uh, because of the surrounding dielectrics. However, when we consider the uh, mobility, we need to go one more step in considering what's the momentum relaxation rate uh, because the momentum is proportional to the lifetime of the electron. So when we uh, want to calculate the momentum relaxation rate, we need to invoke the Fermi's Gordon rule. And we have this following equation where the momentum relaxation rate is proportional to the inverse of the dielectric constant uh, of the system. But uh, we also have proportionality with the matrix element. Now, uh, this matrix element can be seen, uh, can be thought as directly uh, proportional to the on-screen Coulomb potential. So the net effect of the high K environment is that although the dielectric constant decreases, the weakening of the on-screen Coulomb potential is still stronger. So, the, so this term becomes uh, smaller faster than this term. So the overall momentum relaxation rate will decrease, meaning that the moment uh, the mobility uh, of the elect electron mobility of MOS2 will increase. So that's why the higher K uh, environment from the surrounding substrates, so, uh, uh, surrounding um, high K dielectrics will suppress the charge impurity scattering. And also, uh, we can think about the carrier density dependence. Now, this carrier density is the carrier density in the MOS2 system. So how does the, uh, the, the system, um, uh, the MOS2 electromobility depend on the carrier density is what we're trying to look at. So uh, you can see that, so we can uh, think about this in the picture of the Fermi circle, as you can see in this diagram. So consider a, a very simplified system where we have just this uh, circular Fermi surface. Uh, then the Fermi wave vector, Kf, will be e uh, proportional to the n, the electron density. So with larger electron density, uh, so consider we, uh, we are thinking about the momentum transfer from the Ki to another, mom another electron momentum, which is Kf, um, the difference being Q. Now, uh, if we want to match the magnitude of the Q in the large Fermi circle system, in this smaller Fermi circle system, now the smaller Fermi circle system means we have the less carrier density, then we can see that there should be more rotation between the K, uh, the initial K versus the final K. So this means that when we have the lower uh, carrier density, then the system will prefer to scatter uh, in a larger angle difference in the momentum. Uh, momentum. So if we have a, in other words, if we have a larger carrier density, then the system will tend to scatter in a lower, uh, with a smaller scattering angle, meaning that the transport will be more directional. And this is also can be said as the scattering rate will actually decrease. That's why in this uh, figure, we can see that uh, the system with uh, this number mean represented carrier density. As the carrier density increases, you can see the, care, uh, the Coulomb momentum relaxation will decrease. Um, yeah, so basically with the larger carrier density, the electron transfer will become more directional and then the, uh, the, the mobility will increase basically. And finally, I would like to mention uh, another uh, key aspect is that the effect of dielectric environment actually becomes uh, stronger with a thinner semiconductor. So if you can see in this figure, as the film thickness of the MOS2 or any semiconductor sandwiched between the dielectrics, um, as it decreases, you can see that the Coulomb scattering rate, which again is inversely proportional to the mobility, has a very large dependence on the dielectric constant of the surrounding materials. Whereas if the MOS2 or semiconductor thickness increases, this all three different curve with different surrounding dielectric constant will merge onto the same curve, meaning that when the semiconductor becomes thick, 
then it becomes like a bulk uh, semiconductor and then it will stop talking to the neighboring substrate and become dominated by the, um, by the effect from itself. Uh, so, okay, so those were the theoretical uh, study of it. And then there's a paper which uh, which actually experimentally demonstrate uh, what we discussed so far. So this paper particularly studied the monolayer MOS2 on different substrates. Um, so the three different substrates uh, basically have different dielectric constant. So uh, as you can see, uh, so, okay, one thing I would like to mention is that they use a single gated structure. So now the field effect transistor will have the top gate here, but in this study, they only had uh, the bottom gate because they want to be, uh, they want to minimize the impurity or contaminates that comes from the top gate fabrication. Now, as you can see in this, uh, uh, their simulation study, uh, we can see that what we studied so far actually um, is correct because when you look at the silicon dioxide um, versus hafnium dioxide, which has larger dielectric constant, you can see that the coulomb potential is much more confined. And then also with respect to the carrier density in the system, if it is increased by a factor of 10, you can see that overall uh, coulomb potential is more screened. Um, so basically, the calculation shows that the mobility increases as a function of the dielectric constant of the surrounding material and also the carrier density within the MOS2. Uh, so, and then, so for the actual experiment, what they did is that they, ha uh, dip uh, they have the single monolayer MOS2 on top of this different substrate, and then they pattern a electrical um, contact so that they can apply the source and drain voltage while measuring the uh, measuring the uh, voltage. So uh, basically the mobility can be found from this simple equation, uh, from the single equation and measurement. And from their measurement, what we can first see is that the overall mobility is the largest with the hafnium dioxide as a substrate. Because again, we discussed that uh, the high K dielectric constant is helpful in screening the charge impurity. And also you can see that the mobility uh, increases as a function of the carrier density you can see in this figure. Uh, so now what you can also see from this figure, especially this one, is that as temperature goes up, the mobility decreases. Now why that would be the case is what I want to further discuss. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the phonon is another important limiting factor to the mobility. So in particular, uh, the, the electrons in MOS2 will excite the surface optical phonons in the substrate and then interact with them. And this can be seen by this following Hamiltonian uh, where we have the electron phonon coupling coefficient and then the annihilation creation operator for the electrons and then also for the phonons. So you can see that the, um, uh, this coupling coefficient actually share the same origin as the charge polarizability of the dielectric. So the reason why high K dielectric is helpful in screening out the charge impurities is because it can be readily, uh, the charge can be readily polarized. But at the same time, because the higher dielectric substrate can be polarized so easily, they will also, uh, the, 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 the high K dielectric substrate will also have the higher coupling coefficient uh, in terms of the electron phonon coupling. So thus, actually, the high K dielectric will, um, while it's reducing the charge impurity scattering, but also it will increase the phonon scattering. So then the question comes, okay, so then what would be the choice? Should we choose the low, low K dielectric for the consideration of minimizing the phonon scattering? Or should we uh, emphasize more on the charge impurity and then go for the high K dielectric. So in consideration of that uh, question, we need to first think about the temperature dependence because the phonon modes follow this simple Arrhenius rule where the mobility will uh, proportional to the exponential of the one over T. So um, at low temperature, you can see that the, the uh, the phonon limited mobility is very high, meaning that at low temperature, phonon does not play that much of a role as a scattering as, as a scatterer. 
So at the low temperature, uh, we, uh, we care more about the charge impurity scattering. But as the, as the temperature goes up, the, uh, the phonon uh, plays a larger role. And eventually, the phonon uh, will dominate the mobility. So uh, when we consider the technological application of our semiconducting materials, we think about the room temperature application. And as you can see, as we approach the room temperature, the carrier transport will actually be phonon limited. Uh, so that means that maybe we need to choose the low K dielectric because uh, we need to think about uh, going to the phonon limited transfer regime at the room temperature. However, what the experiment finds is that the impurity scattering will still dominate if we use the low K dielectric. So again, because low K electric dielectric cannot provide enough screening, the system will still be dominated by the impurity scattering and we will never be able to reach, uh, reach the phonon limited um, regime. So uh, as you can see, for example, in the aluminum oxide as a substrate, which has a dielectric constant of 10, uh, even at the high temperature, you can see this curve, which represent uh, the charge impurity scattering is still dominates compared to the phonon limited scatter, uh, limited scatter, scattering um, from, from this dotted line. Whereas if we consider the hafnium dioxide, we see that at high temperature, there's a crossover between the charge impurity limit versus the phonon uh, scattering limit. So basically, uh, if we want to have the, uh, the highest mobility possible, then we, uh, again, like as we discussed before, we need to enter the phonon limited regime. Uh, but the problem is uh, in uh, the, the current technological limit is indicated by this figure where we have the mobility as a function of the charge impurity density. So uh, all of the, uh, the, the experiment shows that the currently the system, the MOS to charge impurity level is at around 10 to the 12 uh, centimeter square. Um, However, at this uh, particular impurity density, we see that the system is uh, charge impurity limited, meaning that um, because uh, the system uh, is dominated by the charge impurity scattering, uh, the substrate using the high K dielectric substrate like hafnium oxide will generate the, high, uh, generate the higher uh, mobility. However, uh, if the system can be clean enough to enter this phonon limited regime, meaning that if we have the uh, impurity density below uh, 0.3 times 10 to the 12, then we'll be able to reach the phonon limited uh, regime and then uh, reach the intrinsic uh, impure, uh, uh, mobility of 410 centimeters square. Um, so uh, that's why in the current study, the hafnium dioxide will be the best choice as a substrate Whereas in the future, um, uh, as Lewis will discuss more about, if the MOS2 can be very clean enough, then choosing the low K dielectric such as silicon dioxide will be more helpful in reaching the final mobility. Uh, and uh, so these are the papers that I used for this presentation. And thank you for uh, listening to my uh, talk. Yeah. Hello everyone, my name is Luis and I'll be talking about some of the growth techniques that have been shown to improve MOS2 mobility. In this part of the presentation, I'll be focusing on these two papers. The first one talks about multi-layer fabrication of MOS2, while the second one uses modified thiol chemistry to minimize charge impurities. We know that growing multi-layer MOS2 is a challenge mainly because of the two competitive factors that are responsible for the growth behavior. The first one is the surface energy reduction from van der Waals interactions between the substrate and the first layer of, of the MOS2. And the second one is the energy penalty of open edges as the domains evolve. As you can see from this graph, the monolayer configuration is the most stable one for this material. On the right, you can see that the bilayer is metastable since it's the local minimum in this energy landscape. The problem is that 
it's really hard to go from monolayer to multi-layer MOS2 in a layer-by-layer -layer fabrication method. As you have to overcome this huge energy barrier that it's almost 0.3 EV per MOS2. So it is just better to start with bi-layer MOS2 since the beginning. The good thing is that we can optimize the step height to favor bi-layer nucleation. We usually use sapphire steps to guide the nucleation of MOS2. And as you can see from the graph on the right, the formation energy of the bilayer MOS2 drastically decreases as we increase the step height of our terrace. This can be explained by the thickness differences between the monolayer and the bilayer MOS2. Since the terraces usually have a height, a step height of 0.40 nanometers, they're expected to favor monolayer nucleation. But if we increase the step height of these terraces, then it is expected that we're going to be favoring bilayer nucleation since the step height is comparable in size to the thickness of the bilayer MOS2. The good thing is that you can change the height of the steps by only doing thermal annealing. On the left, I have two substrates that were, that were treated at different temperatures. The one treated at 1000 degrees C shows uniform steps with not a lot of variation to them. The problem is that the height is really small compared to the thickness of the bilayer MOS2. But if we increase the temperature to 1,000 degrees, uh, 1,350 degrees C, we can see that the steps get higher, but there's also a broad distribution to the sizes of the terraces. And this change in height can be explained by smaller steps getting joined together to give rise to higher steps. So after we, are, we prepared the, the sapphire and it was engineered to have a larger step height through annealing processes, the, they used a three-stage CVD to grow the bilayer MOS2. They used a sulfur-rich environment with um, molybdenum being the rate limiting factor. They use uh, these temperatures for the molybdenum source and the growth stage. And they claim that, that these temperatures are around 150 degrees higher than what you would use for monolayer MOS2. And this is required because the bilayer nucleus is larger than the monolayer nucleus. So you would, you would have to have higher concentrations of the precursors. And this is attained by doing the reaction at a higher temperature. They were able to characterize the nucleation of bilayer layer MOS2 by looking at early growth stage of the, of the layer. As you can see from the left, the MOS2 domains are growing along these dashed lines, which are claimed to be the steps of your terraces. And then they use AFM to characterize the, the height of the domains that there were nucleated. As you can see, the AFM suggests that the bilayers are nucleating concurrently. And from the 1800 domains that they counted, almost 99% were, were found to, to be bilayers instead of uh, just monolayer MOS2. Then they did some calcul DFT calculations to see if the edges would be aligned or not uh, after the growth process. Since edge alignment is crucial to achieving a uniform bilayer once the domains start merging together. Luckily, they found that for the 3R polymorph, the most stable configuration was the, the one with the edges aligned. And also, that was the case for the 2H polymorph. So it is expected that the bilayer domains are going to grow into a uniform bilayer if we only increase the growth time. So they went ahead and increased, extended the growth time to obtain a uniform bilayer and they were able to attain a one centimeter square sample. During this process, the MOS2 successfully debonded from the substrate to form a continuous film. 
And they calculated that this dom domain coalescence was driven by a huge energy difference. On the left, there's a, an optical microscope of the centimeter squared sample, and it's just to show that there's not any visible defects or problems with the layer, the the, la the layer that they grew. And then to the right, we have some diffraction that diffraction patterns that show threefold symmetry and indicate that the there's a well-defined epitaxial relationship between the MOS2 and the sapphire. So after that, they characterized the epitaxial relationship uh, and they found that the epitaxy layer was growing at a 30 degree angle compared to the substrate. And this was just confirmed through some TM, TM images and some distances from the domains. Now, since MOS2 has different polymorphs, it's really important to know which of the ones you're forming. And they found that the 2H and the 3R are both stable and they have degener degenerate formation energies, which means that the ratio between 2H and 3R domains are, is going to be approximately one to one. So you have a 50, 50 chance that you're going to be getting either the 2H or the 3R. Then they took the bilayer domains they fabricated to make a, a device to test its performance. Uh, as you can see on the right, the mobility of this material is really high compared to others that are uh, found in literature. In fact, the bilayer uh, domains were found to have mobility 20 times higher than the monolayers that they fabricated. So bilayer fabrication of MOS2 has been shown to successfully improve mobility of MOS2. The second paper that I want to talk about is one where they were able to repair sulfur vacancies through the use of a thiol that is usually commonly known as MPS. And this is a, the actual name of the, of the compound that they used. This is a suggested reaction route that MPS takes to repair the sulfur vacancies. And you can see that it starts by just attaching to the monolayer and releasing this hydrogen that is going to combine to the sulfur right next to the vacancy. Then after some reactions, this hydrogen is going to recombine with the compound and then just leave the sulfur behind, successfully repairing the, the sulfur vacancy. As you can see on the left, the as exfoliated sample has a lot of sulfur vacancies, uh, and these are shown by the red arrows but they were successfully repaired after doing some MPS treatments, uh, which is almost decreased by half, um, which is really amazing. Then they, they were able to compare the mobilities uh, of the as exfoliated sample and then two different annealing uh, routes with MPS. And you can see that both the the MPS treated samples perform way better than the just as exfoliated sample. With that, I would like to end this presentation and thank you for your time. And we look forward to answering any questions on Monday. Thank you.